Well, thank you very much. I want to uh, thank Father Ellis and the whole Villanova uh, University for uh, this great honor. It's a, certainly a privilege to be here, and, and uh, uh, Professor Carol Bessel, who was on the faculty here, I think got this uh, going some time ago, and it's, uh, it's truly an honor. Uh, Tony was helping me get ready this morning, and, and I commented on his tie, and I said, I appreciate you wearing a Carolina blue tie. And he said, I wouldn't quite go that far. Um, <laughs> so I guess there's other shades of blue here. Um, so uh, thank you very much. I, I thought I would sort of walk you through uh, the latest focus uh, in our laboratory and try to do it in the context of um, a lecture that is uh, broadly based and, and hopefully interesting to a number of people and have you think about some of the things that drive our laboratory and, and sort of, you know, we do curiosity driven research and some things that are really interesting to us today are related to shape and the role of shape in nature and one of the best examples of, of shape in nature certainly are relevant to bacteria. Bacteria come in a wide range of, of shapes and I love this quote here, to be brutally honest, few people care that bacteria have different shapes, which is a shame because bacteria seem to care very much. <laughs> and it's true that the earliest scientists uh, characterized bacteria based on shape. And what's also quite clear is that there is a, a processes, selection processes, and, and here with the Mendel lecture, thinking about uh, genetics, the selection pressures that have driven uh, different shapes um, and some of the selective advantages associated with those selective pressures related to perhaps a, a, a lower or higher surface to volume ratio for accessing nutrients uh, or cell division and a symmetry of shape so that when a cell divides there's equal partitioning of genetic material uh, or the ability for bacteria to disperse in their environments or have a certain sort of threshold in, in water so that they have enough sunlight but are, are not too far and the ability for particles to diffuse and, and be stable. Or the ability of bacteria to uh, undergo motility or movement. And what's really interesting is if you look at the different types of bacteria, uh, some of the bacteria shapes are driven or are derived for enhancing motility. So if you look at bacteria that are found in really viscous environments, like a mucosal membrane, uh, a lot of bacteria are spiral in their shape, and that, that's easier for them to translate or move uh, in that viscous environment. Kind of like a corkscrew going through a cork, it's easier to, if it can spin, to move it's a, if it's a really viscous environment. And so when we begin looking at the role of shape in all sorts of different uh, entities, you start to see some beautiful shapes and function. Uh, you look at, obviously, a, an interesting character here with Ebola, a very sp specific shape, uh, H5N1 virus. You look at the different shapes of different viruses, or maybe at a little bit longer length scale, you look at the moth eye and the anti-reflective aspects of moth eyes. Uh, and this really interesting shape here, this is pollen and the characteristics that allow pollen to be easily dispersed. Um, and then you think about shape embedded at another length scale, on the nanoscale. Uh, certainly these are nanoscale objects. Um, a billionth of a meter is a nanometer. And so you think about objects that might only be 50 nanometers in diameter. And then you start looking at an object like this. This is a butterfly wing. And the color associated with a butterfly wing is not derived from an organic dye, uh, as many of the organic chemists are, uh, teach us about uh, uh, absorption and color, but in fact, color in this case is derived from uh, nanoscale objects that are able to physically interact with light on the length scales of light, and you get beautiful diffraction patterns that give rise to beautiful colors, completely void of organic dyes. And so there's a lot of inspiration out there for thinking about natural uh, objects and, and life itself and thinking about can we in fact try to mimic or employ some of those uh, characteristics in other materials. So the federal government across and uh, actually international governments 
have put a lot of effort into this area called nanotechnology. And there's been billions invested in nanotechnology. And this is just a gathering of some images of nanoscale objects that have been the result of billions of dollars of investment. Much of what we know in, about, in nanotechnology is derived from objects that look like this. Uh, these are liposomes and my cells. These are like soap molecules self-assembling into larger structures, so many molecules coming together to self-assemble. These are quantum dots, uh, particles of, of different semiconductor materials. These are uh, either gold or silver particles that give rise to different absorption characteristics when placed in solution. And these are gold particles and these are carbon nanotubes. And so this is a state of the art in nano. And one of the challenges is how do we fabricate specific shapes, arbitrary shapes, that may be inspired from nature and try to get it into new materials. These traditional techniques for fabrication uh, leave a lot of challenges on the table about how to do this effectively. And so when we begin looking at ways of making things on a nanoscale, there's two big categories for doing this. One would be what we've been limited with to date, and that's sort of this bottom-up approach, atoms into clusters of atoms, or molecules into self-assembled structures. But there's a whole other world out there on nanoscale fabrication, and that's what's found in the semiconductor industry. And many of you have certainly seen how computer chips are fabricated in advanced lithographic uh, technologies. These are highly precise manufacturing tools. People are gowned up to avoid nanoparticles contaminating the wafers during fabrication. And this is a big part of our economy today, and it has been honed to be really effective in fabricating arguably the most important invention in the history of mankind, and that's the transistor and integrated circuits that drive everything uh, that we sort of walk around today and we're totally wired with. And there is something out there called Moore's Law, and uh, how many people have heard of Moore's Law? All right, anybody want to offer a definition of Moore's Law? Have somebody from the computer department maybe, or? Moore's Law is basically the, uh, the doubling of the number of transistors found on a wafer basically every 18 months. And uh, Moore, uh, man, was Gordon Moore, founder of Intel, small little company Intel that grew into a monstrous company. And if you look at Moore's Law and you look at the number of transistors, a, a computer chip hasn't changed very much. They still been, they're still a couple centimeters in, in, in size. Back in the early 70s, they were about the same size, but they could only fit about 2,000 transistors on that computer chip. And that's because the minimum feature size was about 10 microns, or about the size of a single cell. And a cell in biology is about 10 microns. Today you buy a chip, the chips are about the same size, a couple of square centimeters, but now they're able to, to fit billions of transistors into the same relative area because a minimum feature size is now down to the size of a virus particle. So in biological terms, Moore's law has gone from the size of a single cell down to the size of a single virus particle. And so what my laboratory is focused on is can we adapt the fabrication techniques embedded in the semiconductor industry used to make computer chips to make particles uh, out of organic materials that would allow them to be more useful as medicines and vaccines. And that's sort of the, the bridge of two different fields that we're trying to uh, develop. And if we're successful, the opportunity of doing this can have a major impact on huge segments of our economy to improve the health and well-being of people, but also perhaps to drive down the cost of health care and maybe even allow global access. To, to advanced technologies, and that's what I want to sort of get to uh, at the end. So we developed a technique we call PRINT, as was mentioned. It stands for Particle Replication Non-Wetting Templates. You don't have to worry about the details. The point is that we actually start with silicon wafers, just like the semiconductor industry. These are patterned with certain shapes using advanced lithographic techniques. And what we do is we invented some polymers, some, uh, we initially called it liquid Teflon, 
And that was before the, uh, the, the trademark people from DuPont sent me a, a letter, don't call it liquid Teflon anymore. And so we had to publish a retraction in the Journal of the American Chemical Society, uh, but it appeared in the obituary section, so nobody sort of reads that. <laughs> so everyone now calls this liquid Teflon and associates that. So we accomplished our goal here. And uh, this liquid Teflon will wet every nook and cranny of these wafers, and then we shine a light on it, and we can convert it to a solid within a few seconds. And so we're actually making what we think of as almost like an ice cube tray on the nanoscale made out of something that's Teflon-like. And so when you think about Teflon, a lot of people think about non-stick, easy release, and in many ways that's what this is. It's a non-stick ice cube tray on the nanoscale. And what we do is that we fill each one of these cups with a liquid shown in red, which is gonna be the precursor to a medicine or a vaccine. And we do this in a roll-to-roll -roll manufacturing process. We we're able to fill the cups without wetting the land area between the cups, which is really important on an, and it's hard to do on a nanoscale, but we use details of wetting to control where it fills and where it doesn't and capillary forces. And then we, once we have an individual pool of liquid, just like in an ice cube tray, we will solidify it. Sometimes we cool it down. Maybe we fill it hot and cool it down to room temperature. Or sometimes we induce chemistry and we gel it and it becomes a particle. And then what we do is we marry that filled mold with another film that's shown in yellow has an adhesive, run it through a roller, it pulls all the particles out, and then we dissolve away the adhesive and we end up having particles. So it's a simple molding technology using roll-to-roll, -roll, uh, film-based, and this is kind of like the way Polaroid used to do things, and for the young people out there, we used to use film in cameras, <laughs> and now we don't, obviously, but. Uh, uh, we employ a lot of ex-Polaroid uh, people uh, in our company. And this is the film that we make, and I have an example of this film here. Uh, you may see a little bit of rainbow-like colors to it, and you can see the, the patterns. These are extremely uniform ice cube tray, and um, in fact the structures can get to the point where in fact, these structures here, these are about 100 nanometers, and those of you that remember in elementary school about light comes in waves, uh, and this green laser beam, that green light has a wavelength of about 500 nanometers, one wavelength of light. I could fit four or five of those features within one wavelength of this laser beam. So these are really small structures. And it allows us to fabricate structures and we now do it in what's called a GMP uh, compliant manufacturing process, which allows us to actually transition products into people. And this is at a company we spun out called Liquidia. And this is just a, a, a more, uh, perhaps a, a prettier uh, animation of the roll-to-roll -roll process uh, that we're able to actually do and fill these cups, solidify the particles, and then we go in and harvest the particles onto a harvesting sheet, and uh, we do this all continuously, dissolve away the adhesive, and we have our particles. And so this is what we make. These are our particles. And we can now, for the first time, control shape and do this uh, on the micro and nano scale out of organic materials that would be useful in, in medicine and vaccines. And I won't go into too many details, but <clears throat> we can not only make the materials out of multiple components and have one phase, but we also can spatially chemically separate within a particle different chemistries within a particle and do this in a continuous manner. These are some particles that we're really enamored with today. These are very small particles. These are just over 100 nanometers in diameter and about 35 nanometers thick. Put that in context, a red blood cell is 8,000 nanometers in diameter. So these are about 30 nanometers in thickness. And, uh, and these filamentous objects uh, are very systematically controlled in diameter and length from 80 nanometers in diameter and just under 100 nanometers in length out to 5,000 nanometers or five microns in length. And you can just see how flexible they are. We can contune their flexibility and so what my lab is trying to do now is to understand, just like we would get infected by bacteria, 
What role does size and shape play on biodistribution if the particles are administered by different dosage forms? Maybe intravenously, where we can start to watch the particles, we'll put a dye in them, and we'll do whole animal imaging uh, and watch the fluorescence through the entire animal as the particles distribute. We make particles that could have interesting aerodynamic characteristics, and we dose them by pulmonary routes. In inhalation, if you think about some of the largest pharmaceutical products in the world are respiratory diseases, and think about asthma, and cystic fibrosis, and the ability to tune where things go in the airway. Or maybe where particles will accumulate in lymph nodes through an intramuscular injection or a subcutaneous injection, which is really important for designing a vaccine and understanding how we tickle the immune system using particles of size and shape. And so let me walk you through some of these examples. One of my favorite, and it's because of my material science background at Ursinus College, uh, has to do with mechanics, the interplay between mechanics and chemistry. I love that field. And now mechanics and biology is a really rich area too. Red blood cells are really interesting objects. Our red blood cells will circulate for about 120 days. And they're able to, and they're eight microns in diameter, and they're able to pass through a three micron size pores in the sinusoids of our spleen, double in length, squeeze through that pore, pop out the other side, and recirculate. And they do that all the time. Until they get older, when a red blood cell will begin to get stiff, kind of like a lot of us do. And that stiffness prevents them from getting through this filter in the spleen. And that's how the body will let young red blood cells pass and mechanically filter out old red blood cells, digest those, and the cycle continues. And so that's a really interesting area. Another important observation is that cancer cells are 10 times more deformable than regular cells. And metastatic cancer cells are 10 times more deformable than regular cancer cells. Mechanics, or flexibility, is a phenotype of cancer. The more these cells become flexible, the more they're able to get into places they don't belong. And the genetics of cancer has used mechanics as the, uh, in evolution to drive, uh, drive the successful adaptation of tumors. And so people know a lot about mechanics of cells. And so now we use print. And these are our red blood cell mimics. We can now mold. Uh, you know, we even put a red dye in there to help you guide your thinking. Uh, but these are mimics of red blood cells. They have the same size, the same shape. We can put different dyes in them. You can see them coming off the print line here. And we're very interested in using these as long circulating vehicles uh, in, in the body. And I thought I'd share some uh, of that work with you. We recently published this. We can skip the chemistry. That's not that important. And, uh, but we can vary the flexibility of these particles. And what you see here, these are filters, a microfluidic device, where we're flowing these red blood cell mimics through and we're watching how flexible they are. And they're very elastic. And uh, once we get the elasticity down to the same elasticity as a red blood cell, they're very effective at getting through these gates. And we can quantify the details of the mechanics with, uh, with photography and we can look at the degree of extension. And when the particles are stiff, they get caught and they can't get through these gates. And so it allows us to quantify the details of mechanics as a function of changing the elasticity in a very systematic way. And so then we end up actually going into uh, animal models. And these are our particles going through the capillaries in the ear of a mouse. And we just have an anesthetized mouse with a mi microscope just sitting on the earlobe. And we can look at the capillaries right through the skin and we can watch our particles as a function of time. And we can calculate the kinetics of distribution. How long do they circulate? And we do that as a function of elasticity. And what we find is that once we match the elasticity of a real red blood cell, the circulation times go through the roof. And we end up having long circulating particles, even though they might be as big as a red blood cell. And be able to understand the details of material properties to enhance circulation and adopt the size and shape uh, to enhance perhaps delivery. And where we're going now is that we're putting hemoglobin 
in these particles. You can buy hemoglobin. You can get recombinant hemoglobin. And we haven't published this yet, but I'm just sharing some data with you. We now are able to load these particles with a large amount of hemoglobin. And we can sequester it into these particles. And we're now trying to quantify the oxygen binding capacity and carrying capacity of this synthetic blood. Wouldn't it be cool to have a synthetic blood that has the ability of carrying oxygen that perhaps might not have to be refrigerated? Perhaps it might not have to be typed, like all the different blood types. And so we're beginning to look at ways of, of moving this forward using the tools of semiconductor manufacturing in a roll-to-roll -roll scale up process. We're taking that same soft chemistry, we're beginning to design that in smaller particles and look at can we get particles to accumulate in tumors? Can we get particles to accumulate in joints? If you have osteoarthritis and wouldn't it be terrific if we have long dwelling particles that could release uh, an antibody that could scavenge uh, uh, inflammatory um, molecules. We're very interested in the role of size and shape on cell uptake. You know, we have cells that are constantly looking around our body to look for foreign bodies, macrophages and dendritic cells. And we're beginning to look at the details that shape matters a lot on the ability of cells to take up particles. And uh, these are hex nuts. You don't have too many hex nuts floating around your body, but uh, this was just an experiment to look at the details. Unless you're a mechanic, maybe you might have a couple of hex nuts. These are alveolar macrophages. These are the macrophages that protect our airway and remove pollutants when we breathe them in. And these are particles. And what we're finding is there's some really profound patterns emerging on the ability of cells to internalize particles. And obviously pathogens have specific shapes, and I'm going to come back to that point in a little bit. But if we get the size of a particle with these arms, if we get them within something called a cell surface ruffle length scale, we have tremendous uptake of these particles in these cell lines where we have other shapes that don't quite have the rate of uptake. So we can have shapes that preferentially are taken into these cells and we have other shapes that can detarget these cells. So we're interested in targeting and detargeting based on shape. And these are just some beautiful blow up images. We, we have these hanging in our house as some artwork. Um, my, I wanted to hang some in the bedroom. My wife didn't want to go quite that far. Um, but uh, certainly some beautiful images of particles being taken up by cells. So we know how to get particles into cells. Well, what could you do with that? Well, there's a lot of interest in delivering things into an intracellular environment. Perhaps we want to do gene regulation. In honor of Mendel lecture, that would be interesting if we can modify the uh, genetic uh, material and induce a new gene or maybe suppress a certain gene. The whole biotech industry, which is based on monoclonal antibodies, is pretty much focused on extracellular targets, everything outside of cells. The biotech industry would like to deliver antibodies to inside cells, but one has to have a delivery vehicle for doing that. So we're interested in getting our particles into cells such that they could deliver things in a more effective way. So these are ovarian cancer cells, um, and these are our particles. Again, we, I'm showing you hex nuts because they're visually interesting, not, not that important actually as an object size and shape. And what we've been able to do is to make these particles into Trojan horses. The pH, or the acidity, with inside a, a cell is lower than it is outside the cell. So we can use a change in pH as a way of triggering the degradation and dissolution of these particles. So once a particle enters a cell, if we get the chemistry right, the particle enters the cell and begins to dissolve. And those of you that think a little bit about science, we're actually taking advantage of the fact that the particles are technically one molecule because they're networks. We begin to break up the cross links. The particles enter the cell. We create molecules as we break up the cross links. The colligative property of osmotic pressure goes up. Water floods the endosome, ruptures the endosome, and dumps the contents into the cytoplasm. And so we can actually watch this using electron microscopy and confocal microscopy. And then we can now load these particles up with a chemotherapy agent. And so these are cells that have taken up our particles. The particles get inside the cell, begin to fall apart, and release the chemotherapy agent. So it's a selective 
carpet bombing, if you will. Uh, and I love this video. We have it up on YouTube now. Uh, to be able to really potently deliver a chemotherapy agent to an intracellular environment. I'll do it one more time. <laughs> all right. And so we have, a, we have all sorts of different drugs. I'm showing you another one here, so we do a lot of synthesis. But this is a frontline drug for pancreatic cancer and a whole other, host of other cancers that we can covalently attach to our particles and we can dial in the release rates. So you can see the game we're playing. We're trying to use size and shape to look at where particles go. Can we get preferential uptake in certain organs and not other organs? Can we get preferential uptake in certain cells and not other cells? Can we begin targeting with different types of chemical characteristics as well as shape characteristics? And what we're now able to find is that with certain tumors, this is an ovarian cancer uh, model, animal model, we can now put 20 times more drug into a tumor using these approaches than one can with a standard of care drug. So a lot of our chemotherapy agents are systemic, are poisons that we give systemically, and we hope that some of it gets to the tumor. And so we're trying to use these characteristics of size and shape to more effectively deliver those drugs so we actually dose less but we're dosing it more effectively and therefore uh, because we're dosing it more locally. So that's in, in cancer treatment. One of the really interesting areas that we think a lot about is pulmonary delivery. And if you look at what we typically dose, these are what the particles would look like for some of the dry powder inhalers that one would use for asthma or uh, other types of uh, medicines. And if you know a child that's on cystic fibrosis, you know, that's a, that's a big effort on a whole family. They're typically on their nebulizers for four or five hours a day doing local treatments. And a lot of it's because of inefficient delivery to the airway. And so there, people have written that there's a lot of really important needs, unmet needs in medicine. And so I think, you know, especially for the young people to think about that out there, strategy is all about being different. You want to focus on targeting unmet needs. You don't want to be a me too. We don't, need the, we don't need the sixth answer to the same problem. Right? We need new answers to problems we can't solve yet. And so this is an opportunity for us to think about can we more effectively deliver and use the characteristics of shape to do this. And so if you look at the airway, it's a fascinating uh, organ or system of organs uh, that one has a huge need for delivery depending on what disease types you're focused on. If you have tuberculosis, you know, that's, a, that's, a, that's a, uh, an infection in a deep airway, uh, and those bacteria are in macrophages in the airway. If you have some upper airway issues, that's a different regional dis distribution for asthma, for example. And so there's a lot of interest in the pharmaceutical industry for tailoring where things go in the airway and controlling flight characteristics and deposition characteristics. So there's a lot of shapes in biology and in nature that we can think about that affect flight characteristics. This is a helicopter maple seed. We all know these are auto-rotating objects in a low-velocity airstream. They actually, can, they actually cause a leading-edge vortex and they create aerodynamic lift. So we're beginning to use characteristics of shapes inspired by nature to drive sedimentation rates to control where things deposit in the airway. These objects we now know are auto-rotating uh, at different velocities in the airway. And what's important is that print allows us to make particles out of pure pharmaceutically active ingredients. These particles here are 100% made from an enzyme that's used to chew up uh, mucus and lower the viscosity of mucus. It's an enzyme that will break up the long macromolecules of DNA that cause a lot of the viscosity. We can make them out of pure antibacterial or antifungal. Uh, these are pure siRNA particles, and uh, we can make particles out of pure drugs now have controlled size and shape. And we quantify using computational fluid dynamics their sedimentation rates and how quickly they drop, and we can now tailor this information to make more effective medicines, and we can begin dosing particles and show that as we change the size and change the shape, we can now have regional deposition in the airway 
for more effective design and, and delivery of pharmaceutical medicines. So this is a big focus for us right now. We're actually spinning out a new company that's focused 100 percent in respiratory disease. The last area I want to talk about is pathogens. And, um, and can we now exploit the ability of controlling size and shape to have more effective defenses uh, for pathogens? And uh, not just bacteria have different shapes, but viruses have different shapes. And so let's look at vaccines. The first generation of vaccines were basically live, attenuated, whole pathogens, somewhat deregulated or somewhat denatured in their, in their approach. But we would give typically these whole pathogens, and the body recognizes these objects and the chemical cues on the surface of these objects. Now, these were really effective vaccines, but they had safety issues. People actually would get the disease, and so safety is paramount. And so the second generation of vaccines that are used today are so-called subunit vaccines, where people basically strip off some of the molecules off the surface of the virus coat, or maybe some of the molecules off the flagella of a bacteria, uh, and would deliver these molecules to be the vaccine. Now, your body recognizes these molecules, your innate immune system, but we also know that your macrophages are used to taking up objects. And we've now given up the object aspects for just a molecular aspect. And so what we're simply trying to do is can we combine the molecules on basically replicas of the original pathogen and recapitulate something that's more closely aligned with the pathogen itself because we know that your macrophages take up objects of certain sizes and shapes. And there are patterns associated with that that we're trying to exploit. And so let me just show you, I'm going to show you some data. Um, <clears throat> this is actually our first product that we moved into the clinic. This is an influenza vaccine. These are particles made using our print technology. This is the same material. Uh, it's made out of the same material as a bioabsorbable suture. So it's fully, you know, the FDA's got a lot of familiarity with this material. It's a polymer of lactic acid and glycolic acid. So when your body breaks it up, it's just, a, it's just lactic acid and glycolic acid. So what we do is we take these particles, and they're here in, the, in these bottles, and we simply mix the same influenza vaccine that you and I get. And that, these are molecules. It's a trivalent peptide-based uh, vaccine. Within minutes, 90% of these molecules will bind to the surface of these particles onto the surface. And then we co-administer that as a vaccine. And when we do that, we get a 12-fold improvement by delivering the vaccine with our particles than one gets with the vaccine all by itself. So we have this huge increase in performance. And it's, there are a lot of complicated reasons we believe that this is happening, but it's more effective delivery, ultimately. And so remember, the vac seasonal flu vaccine was in short supply not too long ago. And so this is the ability of trying to perhaps extend the, the dosage range to allow more people to get very precious medicines. This is the team at our company, Liquidia, that brought this forward. This is all the paperwork we had to submit to the FDA to, to do this. So we kill a tree or two uh, in order to move this product forward. But where we're going now is to try to unlock this behavior and putting all sorts of adjuvants which helps tickle the immune system coupled with these antigens for more effective vaccines. And we have a broad-based program in doing this, and one uh, that we're pretty excited about is we have terrific data in malaria, uh, and we have a big partnership uh, with the Malaria Vaccine Initiative. And so I actually had a chance to meet uh, Bill Gates about a year ago uh, at a meeting, and I knew I would have about 10 seconds of his time. And you think about the elevator speech. Um, what are you going to say to somebody like that? And, you know, it's Bill, this is Joe, Joe, this is Bill, you know, what do you do? I said, well, Bill, we're using manufacturing techniques of the computer industry to make new vaccines. All right, so we just hardwired Microsoft and the Gates Foundation. And that turned into an uh, almost 30-minute conversation. I sort of had him at hello and, uh, and drove what turned out to be the first equity investment ever by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation in a for-profit biotech. And it was a $10 million equity investment. So we're very focused on delivering uh, vaccines 
not just to the developed world, but also the developing world. And the one we're really excited, and, and this particular one we're excited about is we have cancer vaccines that we're driving forward. And so we have a prostate cancer vaccine initiative, so it's not just infectious diseases, but can one turn your own immune system towards tackling uh, cancer cells? And the last vaccine I'll tell you about, and I'm gonna explain it in a very low resolution that it's gonna be understandable. Um, when Lipitor comes off patent this year, the largest pharmaceutical product in the world will be a vaccine called Prevnar 13. Prevnar 13 is given to every child in a developed world for the most part. And it's against a pneumococcal bacteria infection. There's about 90 strains of these bacteria that's known on the planet. 13 of them are really important in the Northern Hemisphere. And in order to elicit an immune response, what people do is they strip off a molecule off these bacteria strains, a polysaccharide. And there's 13 of them, different ones that are important. And they have to co-deliver these molecules, each of the 13, with a protein. And if you have to co-deliver molecules, what do chemists do? Well, they link them together, okay? That linkage chemistry has a yield of about 15%. And there's 13 reactions. So it's the simple math, it's 0.15 times 0.15 times 0.15 times 0.15 times 0.15, you get it. Pretty soon at the end, how much do you have? Not much. These are very expensive vaccines. The yield is very low. And we now make these using print. And we have almost 100% utilization of the, of the reagents going into this process because we make the particles different. We do delivery differently. And what happens is now, this is an this is a example of this vaccine working. So stay with me, it's not that complicated. This is the standard vaccine, Prevnar, and this is the antibody response. These are an, each individual bullet on here is an animal responding at, successfully to this vaccine. On the initial dose of Prevnar, none of the animals respond, and you have to give booster shots, okay? In fact, this is a four-dose sequence that's given. It's four doses, they charge, they charge $90 a dose, but it's expensive. The cost of goods is $21 a dose. When we do this with print, all the animals respond on the first dose. And it looks like, because of the way we're able to do this, we have about a 70-fold increase in performance. And our cost of goods is better. And it looks like you may not even want these molecules covalently or chemically attached. You want to co-deliver them, but you may not want them linked. You just want them co-delivered. So it looks like our dosage might be less than a dollar a dose on a single dose. So that opens up an opportunity for the first time for these vaccines to be available to the rest of the world because you can't afford a four-dose sequence at 90 or $21 a dose. And so these are the kinds of things we're trying to drive in, in global health, but also the advances of technology to drive down cost in the developed world. I mean, a lot of people talk about technology raising health costs. I think for the young people to think out there, there's a huge opportunity to use technology to drive down costs because you're able to figure out better ways of doing things, as well as opening up the opportunity for global access. So we're pretty convinced that these tools in the computer industry, co-opting Moore's Law, if you will, can have a huge implication in a wide range of areas if you can successfully translate them in a cost-effective way. I talked to you today about therapeutics and vaccines but we're very excited about the opportunity for controlling shape and nanoscale objects on films and other particles such that we can influence a wide range of other areas, even consumer products, uh, using this technology. And so when you think about, this is a, a film clip from Intel, and you think about the impact that the microelectronics industry has on our society, whether it's the technology itself or the construction jobs, or the manufacturing base, which I know jobs is really important for everybody here. Uh, the opportunity for creating jobs in the semiconductor industry has been enormous. And we're pretty excited about the opportunity. Can we adapt and leverage and extend this industry into soft materials to opening up opportunities that in fact might be very different? And these are the kinds of things that we do at Liquidia. Uh, which has got some eerie similarities to what Intel does on a different scale, 
using roll-to-roll-like processes and move those forward in the same sort of way for fabricating uh, now soft materials. And, and these are the things that we're focused on. So let me end there. Uh, it, it takes a team of people to do this. And we are big proponents that diversity is a fundamental tenet of innovation. To be able to get people of all different disciplines, material scientists, chemical engineers, virologists, immunologists, chemists, uh, all working together, thinking about where's the market, and you're working with business people, what are the ethics, and getting people to think about those implications for society, getting all that group together uh, and working on the same team, new ideas can emerge uh, from getting that group working well together. And we, had a trip, we have a terrific team at Liquidia, about 60 people. We've raised about $60 million, including the last $10 million from the Gates Foundation. Uh, this is my laboratory at the University of North Carolina, uh, and it, it embodies that diversity that I mentioned to you, all different disciplines, different socioeconomic backgrounds. All those things change the way we think and drive ideas, and harnessing that is really our focus. And even getting the NC State students to stand under the old well at Chapel Hill is, is an indication of how committed we are to doing these kinds of things. And the uh, last thing I'll just mention is that vision without resources is certainly a hallucination. And uh, we are blessed to work with uh, support at both the federal and state level, including really strong support from the National Cancer Institute, the uh, National Institutes of Health. Uh, in the state of North Carolina, we have a $50 million a year fund focused on cancer research called the University uh, Cancer Research Fund, uh, the Department of Defense, and the National Science Foundation and our company, Liquidia. So with that, let me end. I want to thank you very much for coming. I really appreciate it. So we're going to entertain questions, and certainly there's a mic here. It might be easier. I can certainly repeat it, and the students will get on to some activities. And <laughs> go ahead. First of all, your presentation was remarkably interesting, and I think for myself and many other folks in the Why audience, it was very inspirational. I could repeat those comments, but I, I, I dare not to. <laughs> he said it was a really good talk. <laughs> and uh, can we turn on his mic here? What I'm curious about, uh, most of what you discussed is in the area of chemistry and uh, technology. Um, in order to demonstrate things like safety and efficacy for these nanotechnology applications, I'm wondering if you would anticipate there might be any differences in uh, pharmacokinetics yep. and the ways in which these compounds are metabolized or excreted yep. at so the nanotechnology scale. Yeah, let me repeat the question. So there's, there is, uh, he's from the pharma industry and uh, asking about issues, about regulatory issues and, and uh, CMC issues and things to be able to move these things forward. Uh, and does nano have any particular issues that might be unique compared to the, the normal FDA? So we, I actually sat uh, at lunch yesterday uh, um, with uh, uh, the commissioner of the FDA, uh, Margaret Hamburg, and visiting North Carolina and her team. And there is a lot of guidance being issued now about how to deal with nanotechnologies and rapidly, rapidly get these approved. You know, the, the FDA has is, is, is got a tremendously difficult job. They're told to guarantee safety, right? I can understand it for food and maybe cosmetics and some other things. But, you know, we start talking about medicines and guaranteeing safety. There, there's risk, and it's risk mitigation, understanding the risks. And, um, and so they're coming out with unique guidance associated with nano uh, about how to think about these and how to characterize them. And they're working closely with the National Cancer Institute to have the science, the regulatory science, necessary to drive, help drive some of these new areas because this is where the economies, uh, the jobs of tomorrow are coming from these new investments. You know, and I'll just add a little bit. I had the privilege of, of starting a medical device company back in 2002 that, that helped develop a bioabsorbable stent, a coronary heart stent made out of plastic that would go away after about 18 months. And it's now part of Abbott. The company was bought out. 
Um, the regulatory pathway drove that technology overseas. And, uh, and now that we just got CE mark approval in Europe, we have about 1,000 people with these bioabsorbable stents coming online. And some are 50 or 60 people have been out four years. And so here's advances in technology uh, because of the regulatory environment is different in Europe and easier that these new technologies are going overseas that were born and bred in the United States. There's some really interesting job creation issues with that. But where it's at now, it's even a little bit scarier we have a new company coming out in some of the oncology space that we're being told by Big Pharma who has an enormous amount of cash overseas from or over half their business is international now that they want, us to, they want to use those dollars to start our company but if they repatriate those dollars they have to pay a huge tax rate. They want our companies to be located in Ireland. And so now it's not only the technology going overseas, but the companies and the jobs are going overseas because of regulatory issues. So these are complex issues um, that, um, that go far beyond the, a little bit perhaps the question you answered. But uh, we have one product in the clinic now. We hope to, hope to get a whole platform going. Another question? Yes. Today, what's your most successful or widely used application of the natural my big, biggest success has been my family here, but uh, and uh, the mo most widely ad adopted so far is, is certainly that bioverbal stent technology. We we uh, you know there's nothing like uh, you know seeing a patient's and we've got we got it, we got image hanging up in our home of a blocked. You know, not too many people have a uh, an X-ray image hanging in your hanging in your living room, but. Uh, we, we have a person's blockage showing, and then before and after stenting, it's wide open. And um, that turned out to be a huge, I think it's a big deal. My colleague Richard Stack at Duke, we, he's an interventional cardiologist. We collaborated on that. It wasn't basketball season, so it worked out that we could get together. <laughs> and uh, we now have almost 1,000 people coming online with these stents. So that's, you know, that's pretty exciting, and we're hopeful. That, uh, that print and, and moving forward in vaccines and respiratory and, and oncology will come behind that too. Yeah. Great talk. So um, the question I have is about inflammation. So inflammatory responses can be, as you know, is a double-edged sword. I mean, it can help you in response. But at the same time, uh, these particles going into a cell like macrophage or any other cell could possibly initiate an inflammation as other, many other particles have been studied. So are you concerned about that aspect? Yeah, so as you mentioned, inflammation and reactogenicity is a, is a, is a two-edged sword. And you know, when you have a vaccine, you actually want your arm to hurt a little bit. That tells you about it's responding, right? You don't want it to hurt too much. And uh, what's interesting is that these particles out of the both, we're exploring it. So it, Particles made out of PLGA of the size I've shown, 80 nanometers by 320. That's the largest particle we can make that we can sterilize by filtration. And if you can't sterilize something by filtration, you have to make it aseptically. So that brings up another, I won't go into that detail. But both PLGA and the PEG hydrogels that I showed, and I didn't go into the details, we know they don't activate the inflammasome. We've been looking at the details of IL-1 beta generation, and it's Z Zippo. Uh, which some people say, well, that's not good because you want them to be a little bit reactive for a vaccine. So these are benign, at least with these two chemistries, they're completely benign carriers. They're not an adjuvant. They're a carrier, and that now speaks to a different regulatory pathway. So we're now adding adjuvants in a very systematic way to enhance their stimulation of the different toll-like receptors in a very systematic way. So we are now doing a combinatorial set of experiments we're making different particles of different chemistries, different sizes and different shapes, and different agonists to different toll-like receptors and nod-like receptors, and just looking at what the data generates so that we can turn on maybe TLR4, 7, but not 9. And could that be useful as a cancer vaccine and better as a yellow fever vaccine? So we're trying to collect that data now, but the carriers themselves are completely, they're not, and, and uh, we're surprised by that. I'm also amazed to see that you had an IgG response yeah. in the carbohydrates that yeah. sitting on that. That's, and that's amazing. Well, that's a, that tells you it's co-delivery, right? So you get class switching. Yeah. Yeah, we're, that's what we're excited about. 
Who do you work for? Or are you, are you, are you, in, are you at Villanova? I'm a Great, great, great. Yeah. I, cu I couldn't go much deeper in that conversation. I was at the, my edge, so. Uh, these particles, as they are collected from the wafers, are they ready to be used, or do they need to have a secondary processing in order to design the surface chemistry um, to avoid coagulation of the particles after you remove them from the template? You must be from the pharma industry. Yeah, yeah I, I can tell. I can tell. Uh, no, you're right. And so they're actually made on film. So we use the silicon wafer only as a master template. And then we make these films, and these films are disposable. And we've got to be green, and someday we'll recycle these. We're not right now. Um, but then they're, they're, they're in a two-dimensional array in an unaggregated state. And so when we actually harvest them, we start the formulation thinking in the process to keep them uh, unaggregated using our different formulation packages. And then we can actually st store them on film, cold, and we're interested in doing that to maybe uh, enhance storage capability, uh, maybe in defense stockpile applications. But we also uh, harvest them and, and lyophilize them. And so we, we've entered the clinic uh, with that, that one influenza vaccine. And when we submitted it to the FDA, we had no CMC questions on our first product, you know, which I think speaks to the team we have. And so my formulation is important, really important. And I, I skipped a lot of those details. That yeah, 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 yeah. But it's, but, but it's, you know, to your point, uh, we are well within the cost curves associated with vaccines, uh, and then we're beginning to move into the cost curves associated with larger volume products like chemotherapeutics, and in respiratory, we're well within the cost curves. And so, what's interesting, it's, it's, it's at some level, it sounds a little stupid to make particles on a surface and harvest them because. It's like scraping off all the transistors off your silicon wafer, right? There's a lot of them there, billions, but there's not much mass. That's why we have to go continuous. But when you think about it, if your particles are, made, are 10 microns thick and you, and you have a film, and you think about a 50% aerial density, because you pack them as close as you can, but not completely, one square foot is 400 milligrams. Okay, and we now have a machine that's 24 inches wide running at 100 feet a minute. So we can make products that, that will fulfill needs in respiratory. So we're beginning to look at that. And we even have a consumer products company. It's on our website, Procter & Gamble. And can we now start moving these products into, into consumer products? So the manufacturing scale is happening. And it's going to take innovations in manufacturing with the product pool. But we started with vaccines uh, to get a, get a, a foothold. Uh, yes. Yeah. Are there any uh, plans to use uh, these nanoparticles as vectors to transport things like uh, radioactive ions or uh, magnetic ions, which could be used for uh, diagnostic imaging or also for cancer treatment? So uh, we, we, we have a great partnership with the team at Sloan Kettering, which are powerhouses in, in immunothera radiotherapies. And, um, and one of my postdocs just got a faculty position in radiology at UNC that's uh, he wants to couple these with PET and, and, and SPECT imaging agents, but also the radioisotopes uh, for the therapeutically interesting ones. So yeah, that's, that's coming. Yeah, there's some great opportunities for doing that. Thank you. Yeah, that's a cool area. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering a little more of the technical side behind the particles that you're making. Um, I'll, do my, I'll do my best to answer. <laughs> Currently, I'm working on a particle, like a nanoparticle, um, for breast cancer drug delivery. Great. Ours are way, way bigger than yours. But, uh, are you simply making? Were you, were you, were you, were uh, you glowing? <laughs> <laughs> it's like golf. Smaller is better. Yeah. yeah. Terrific. So uh, that's great. Those are good things to do. So we're, on our film process, we actually make a homogeneous, the delivery sheet would be 
drug and polymer, and it might, in fact, with that nano letters paper that I, sh I may have alluded to, but you look up, we had a nano letters paper in 2011, talks about 40% drug and PLGA uh, out of these, this particle series. But we also do targeting, and so we have Herceptin, so for the HER2 positive breast cancer cell lines, to try to bring a tar targeted version of these particles forward. And why we like these is because we could, when combining nanoparticles with the antibody conjugation, you can get up to uh, 10 to the seventh chemotherapy molecules per antibody, which is very different than what Genentech's doing, where they're just putting you know, four or eight molecules per antibody. So I think that what you're working on is a terrific direction to go, and I'd love to talk to you more about that. Have you looked at uh, synergy between your particles and a known vaccine where both of them together can get a greater result? And for example, toxoids are very immunogenic. You know, can you get a greater result with both together? You know, a lot of people have talked to us about that. I'm way out over my ski tips to comment on that at all. But uh, people, have t people that are domain experts have talked to us about the ability of doing that, where there's some, for example, some of these 13 polysaccharides have different levels of effectiveness, and maybe you can combine the really challenging ones with our particles and the not so challenging ones with other people's approaches and do combination approaches with that. So I've heard people talk to us about that. I, I, I don't intelligently know how to combine them directly, but in the cancer world, we, we're thinking a lot about combination drug delivery, uh, you know, things that like molecules that would cause DNA damage and other molecules that would inhibit DNA repair to have a really potent system. So some siRNA drug combinations that we're focused on. Okay, uh, let's extend back to the Great, thank you very much. Okay.